This is Greg Meyer. I'm here with Reverend Tony Campolo. We just heard an amazing workshop about the possible for uh, spiritual progress progressives to really make a difference. I was so moved by what you had to say about uh, not just the possibility for hope, but the necessity for hope in this year's political process. Can you talk a little bit about, beyond the rhetoric of hope in the Obama campaign, really what hope means from a spiritual perspective? No, no one political party has a monopoly on goodness and truth. Uh, and I, I have to say that what we all have to do, and I, I'm a spiritual person, I'm into the Bible thing, I'm really into the vision of Jesus. Now, uh, Jesus had this wonderful parable. He said, uh, the kingdom of God is like an unto a man who goes and sows some wheat. The wheat begins to grow. That's the good world, the world that ought to be the kingdom of God. The evil one comes and sows tares, the evil, and that begins to grow. And the wheat and the tares grow up together. And the servants come to the master and say, should we pull out the weeds? And he says, no, because if you do that, you'll destroy half the wheat. Let them grow up together. Comes the harvest, we will separate the two. What Jesus is saying is, yeah, evil's going to be in the world. There's going to be a lot of hard things going on in the world. But the kingdom of God is also growing. The kingdom of God is on the upper side. One of my friends loves to say, I've read the Bible. I know how it ends. We win. That goodness does win in the end. And we need to propagate that. And we got to convince kids because a young guy like you runs around in a university or a college and it, everybody's become so cynical. So cynical. I was at UCLA and I yelled at the students. I'm 73. You're 23. I'm younger than you are. Because people are as, as young as their dreams and as old as their cynicism. And you're cynical and I'm still dreaming. And the Bible says this. When the young no longer have dreams, and the old no longer have visions, the people perish. And this country will perish without visions and dreams. So if they say you're a dreamer or a visionary, just shrug your shoulders and say, without us, the whole world goes down the tubes. I can do that. Okay. Your turn to ask me. Okay. Um, tell me, um, what do you believe will happen to this country in the next 10 years? Well, I, I believe we see right now the seeds of a tremendous opportunity, and uh, it's really a question about whether that opportunity gets uh, fostered or not. And so my hope, my hopefulness, my optimism is um, that seizing an opportunity for change means not just political rhetoric and not just a change in party leadership, but that really our country has an opportunity to build bridges across differences that have hamstrung us and disabled our ability to have a meaningful life for a generation. All shares but that my generation all looks and sees there have been many promises made about how we're going to connect and relate. But now we really have a sincere interest in figuring out new ways, and new approaches that you and I want to relate across age, or across race, or across gender, or whatever it is. Um, we shouldn't let those barriers separate us any longer. That sounds good. Do you want to ask another question? I do. I want to ask you to talk a little bit about the Global Marshall Plan. Well, it's, uh, it's that each uh, of the uh, nations of the world, or the wealthy nations, the G8 nations, should set aside 2% of their uh, federal budget to eliminate poverty on a worldwide scale. My argument is a very simple one. If we had fed the people of Iraq, if we had clothed them, if we had taken care of them, as the Bible says, Saddam Hussein would have fallen. The Bible says, you heap coals of fire on your enemy's head if you do those things. I, I really do believe that uh, my vision is that the, this global plan, this global Marshall Plan, is not just pie in the sky, but in reality, uh, people like Gordon Brown have embraced it. The Prime Minister of England says, I'm for it, I'm going to push it in the Parliament. I think it can happen. We're not talking about a huge sacrifice. We're talking about 1% to 2% of the gross national product of the country. We could eliminate poverty within 10 years. Um, I think this, that when I talk to my conservative friends and say, what do you think about this? They say, if that's what it would take, I'd be certainly willing to sacrifice for that. Uh, people are not afraid of being taxed. They're afraid of seeing tax dollars wasted. 
And that's what's happening to tax dollars, both domestically and abroad. We've got to stop wasting money and spending it on those things that really matter. And we need a government that will be responsible in the use of tax dollars so that that doesn't happen. Okay. Another question for me? Yeah. Um, tell me, um, what do you think of rap music? <laughs> and that's very important because I think it has great social consequences. Uh, I'm worried about it denigrating women. I'm worried about it uh, destroying a sense of morality and advocating, I mean, almost legitimating violence. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm really saying these things, and everybody always comes back and says, they're only expressing the hostility and the anger of an underclass people. Well, yeah, but anger, when it's articulated like that, only increases more anger and more hostility. And what's worse is that there are a bunch of, you know, behind these African-American guys who are screaming and yelling out of the pain of their own lives, there are a bunch of white guys in Hollywood who are making millions and millions of dollars exploiting this by producing the records. And, you know, I have real problems with this. And I'm wondering when young people, because when I say it, say 73-year-old fogey, you know, there he is, an old guy, doesn't like this rap music. When the top song three weeks ago, because I happened to be listening to the radio with my grandson. He said, I want to listen to this top song. Top song was this. Lick me, lick me, lick me, and make it feel good until it comes. I'm saying to myself, this is denigrating, and it is humiliating for the woman who's being asked to do this. Uh, I, I just, I'm upset. So what are you going to do about that? Well, um, not what are you going to think? What are you going to do? Because you're the guys that have got to say it. I, I would s start out by saying this. I think that art always does two things. One is it reflects culture, and two, it projects what we hope could happen in culture. You know, you gave an, you gave an example of where you get your motivation from art today from yeah, by mentioning sure. Les Miserables, and I think that's something that wonderful that art does. But art also reflects where we are right now. And uh, hip-hop and many other forms of our media right now hip or, you know reflect all of the negative messages that you're talking about so what do i do about it i struggle with it with my daughter who's 16 years old and i struggle with it with the high school and middle school students and the upper elementary school students that i work with in my job and what i try to do is to talk to them about conscious consumption and i try to talk with them about what messages do you uh, really pay attention to and how do you deconstruct those messages to decide what impact they have on your life? You know, I found it very interesting that Tolstoy uh, said about Zola, the difference between us is that we both go into the cesspool, but it is one thing to go into the cesspool to cleanse it. It's another thing to go into it to take a bath. I think we do need to face the ugliness of what's going on in the world, and the music does do that. But does it challenge us to create a better world? So I think you're right. Last question for you. Here it goes. If you could have one wish from our new president, President Obama, and have that wish come true, what would it be? To go back to the vision that he articulated in that speech four years ago, because it electrified all of us and made us believe that a better world was possible. It cannot be compromised in order to move to the center because they, the strategists say you can't win an election without that. So that's my commitment. Do you have a final question for me? Uh, yeah. How can a guy that looks as young as you are have a 16-year-old daughter? That's, <laughs> that kind of amazes me. Yeah. yeah. I'm 34 years old. Uh, my daughter Ashley is adopted. Oh. And uh, we adopted her when she was six years old. So you can do the math and figure out how old I was then. But God that's the basic you, of the basics of well, the story. That's very encouraging. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. Everybody look up TonyCampolo.com. You'll find some great information. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye now.